All right, welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris, and today I'm joined with David Steen, or Dr. David Steen. Hey, hey David, how you doing? Doing well. How about you? Doing great, doing great. And Dr. Steen is working at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center in Jekyll Island, Georgia, so kind of near my old stomping grounds and just north of, of Angie. And so we really want to talk today about, you know, snakes and Eastern Diamondback rattlesnakes, but... David has a varied interest in, in a lot of different species, which we'll get to. David, one of the first things we always like to ask is, you know, just kind of give a background, you know, about what you do, how you got involved, you know, with science and research in these species. Sure. How much time you got? Oh, <laughs> we got it. We got about an hour or so. Yeah, okay. But, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to just trying to figure about how far back I should go. But, yeah. uh, in the beginning, know, it's, 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 okay. <laughs> too far yeah yeah uh, for for as long as i can remember i've been uh looking through streams lifting up rocks to catch crayfish and salamanders and walking through woods and looking for beetles and things like that and somewhere along the way i started getting paid for it um mm. and that, that's basically my career trajectory uh i'm from the northeast i did my undergraduate at the university of new hampshire i studied zoology and i kind of got my feet wet uh, literally and figuratively in field work there, uh, studying water snakes. Uh, after that, I headed to the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and I got my master's there studying the effects of roads on turtle populations. Mm. Long story short, the females do something males don't, and that's go on nesting migrations, mm -hmm. and that makes them vulnerable to cars. And so mm. uh, populations started getting male biased where there were lots of roads. Mm. Mm. I did this and that uh, for a while, ended up in southwest Georgia, working at a private research center called the Joseph W. Jones Ecological Research Center. Mm -hmm. I was there for three years studying reptiles and amphibians, and then I started my PhD at Auburn. Okay. Let's see, I got my PhD in 2011. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mostly known for snakes and turtles, but my dissertation was a little bit broader. I was interested in forest restoration and how that affected birds and small mammals and including the reptiles as well. Yeah. So your ecology and conservation, that's, that's, that's what you're doing, right? That's your, that's your focus. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. It's cool. It's, you know, and, and I know some of our listeners, you know, are younger or thinking about their careers in conservation or ecology. Do you have any advice for them? Well, I, yeah, it's enjoy the journey because you never know where the destination is going to be. And if you're having fun, you're having a good time and you're learning and you're making money working with these creatures, keep doing it. Uh, don't do it because you expect it to go to a certain point because, uh, you know, life's unpredictable, but take advantage of any opportunity you feel comfortable doing so. Often it's the experience that you gain rather than uh, your grades. That's so true. I mean, like I said, I'm living in New Zealand and I, I would have never dreamed, you know, when I, fit, when I graduated with my PhD, it's like I had this, this tract in mind and I'm going to do this, this, and this, and then life just takes you in all different directions. And, and now here I am podcasting, right? So sure. yeah, it is. Yeah. Life is a journey. It is. And enjoy it while you can. So did you always want to, you know, it sounds like you always wanted to, to work with animals you know, how did you become a snake expert? Like, where did that come in? I know, you know, from a childhood interest, it sounds like, but, you know, snake science, I guess, is is a way to put it. So where did that really begin? Yeah, like you said, I've always been interested in them. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I was referred to as the snake expert, but it, it, it means a little bit different now. There's a little bit more uh, training and education behind it. Uh, you know, they're just these fascinating creatures. And, uh, a couple things. They have a terrible reputation. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, but also for as much as we see them, for as much as we're fascinated by them, we really don't know that much about them. They're highly camouflaged. Mm -hmm. They spend, you know, 90% of their time underground. That makes it really hard to design a study. So there's a lot of really, you'd think obvious things that we just don't know about these animals. Right. I, I, and for the listeners, we're going to get to one of his studies like here in a minute. I just, I was fascinated reading the title and I just so want to talk to you about it, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. So yeah, I know <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, it was, it was so cool. 
it's like it's funny when you get a phd and you have so many varied interests it's like you you wish you had you know more hours in the day i guess to be able to do some of the things you want to study and it's hard to stay focused on you know one species or one area for sure so right now yeah so you're working at the georgia sea turtle center what do you what's your job there what are you doing Sure. I'm a research ecologist here at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, which is part of the Jekyll Island Authority in Jekyll Island, Georgia. Uh, we've got three pillars going on. We've got rehabilitation, so we're an active turtle hospital. We've got education, so we're dealing with tons of visitors and school kids and campers. And then we also have research, and I'm the research ecologist of the Sea Turtle Center. Mm -hmm. There's a couple main projects, but our flagship is the monitoring of the loggerhead sea turtles that come up to nest on Jekyll Island right now, as a matter of fact. So we've got uh, people on the beach every night looking for loggerhead sea turtles, and the next shift is going to start in hmm. a few hours. Cool, cool. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, I was last summer I was vacationing up in the Gulf in Florida, and, you know, a lot of protected areas, you know, roped off and sign. So is that kind of like a standard thing with the loggerheads? I know we're, we're kind of focused on snakes with this one, but you know, I, I wanted to jump in on them because we just did a, an episode on the snapping turtle. And I know soon we're going to do the loggerhead just because again, they're amazing <clears throat> and everything that's going on with the oceans. Cool. Right. So are you finding, you know, in the United States or even around the world that there's a lot of these protected areas for the sea turtles? Well, sea turtles have an advantage over lots of other rare creatures in that they're very charismatic. And so there's mm -hmm. a lot of interest and attention in protecting these animals. But it's kind of a mixed bag. In the United States, the, all sea turtles are protected by the Endangered Species Act. So there are a lot of people and a lot of projects uh, to protect the animals, to restore beaches. That's not always the case everywhere, but... I'm optimistic that they are on a positive trend. Right. And is you're right. It is charismatic and people, you know, are focused on them and like, oh, wow, sea turtles. And so, you know, when we did the thing on the snapping turtles, you know, they're kind of off the radar. I mean, yeah, they're, they're cool. And everybody's like, oh, my God, snapping turtles are really cool. But their conservation, I mean, they're, you know, losing their habitat and they're really in trouble. So is that kind of you know, standard or, or what you're seeing across, I'd say, turtles and tortoises uh, in the United States that their populations are in decline? Yeah, it's true that worldwide turtles as a group are one of the most imperiled groups of organisms, you know, right at or even worse than non-human primates. So they're in pretty bad shape. A lot of that conservation status is driven by issues in Asia However, we've got a lot of problems here as well. We've got we've got a lot of rare species, and as you mentioned, habitat loss is the big problem. Okay. Yeah. For yeah, for loggerheads and other sea turtles, they really like the same beachside habitat that we do. So there's a, a conflict brewing. Uh, there's a lot of room for a compromise uh, when it comes to who gets the beach, whether it's the nesting female loggerheads that need kind of an undisturbed beach without a lot of lights or the people that come to like uh, to, you know, spend their vacations here. We've got to find a balance. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And you know, it's, it's talking to experts around the world with, with animals. It's, it's working to conserve these areas and come up with solutions. So scientists like yourself are critical in the discussion. So, uh, you know, I just like to say up front, thank you for what you do. It, it, I know, you know, way back when, it seems unappreciated at times, but now that I have kind of an outsider's view, what you're doing is, is amazing. So thank you, you know, for our listeners. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm having the time of my life, so it doesn't really feel <laughs> right to thank me, but I appreciate yeah, the sentiment. Yeah. Now you work with alongside wildlife foundation. Can you kind of talk about that? You know, what are you doing with them? Sure. So my day job is the Georgia sea turtle center. And then on my own time, I'm the executive director of the Alongside Wildlife Foundation. This is a registered 501c3 nonprofit charity that I founded in early this year, early 2018. And one of the, one of the reasons I, I'm excited about the foundation is that uh, we really want to help produce and promote science-based solutions for a living alongside wildlife. 
and right now we're focusing on funding other scientists and science communicators. We're often saying that you know natural history is really important, science communication is really important, but there aren't a lot of incentives or funding mechanisms for that work. So that's a niche that we're trying to fill right now. No, it, it, it's absolutely true. It, it's, you know, as scientists communicating, you know, with the public, explaining our research, you know, trying not to use big jargon, but, you know, breaking it down so people understand what's going on. So I, that's, that's great. And just for the listeners, uh, David does have a website that I highly suggest you visit. Obviously, I'll put the links in our show notes, but it's www.davidasteen.com. And that's David A S T E E N, and you can go there and he have his blog and and kind of keep tabs on on what he's doing. And I'll remind you at the end of the show uh, again. So what, I guess as a as a scientist, you know, working at this center, what's an average day for you consist of? Sure, I usually have a pretty good idea how the day is going to start, and the way that it ends is often kind of a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'll come in. Uh, it's a matter of meetings. We've got a lot of kind of interdepartmental projects going on, uh, catching up on emails, designing projects, doing statistical analyses, writing papers. That's the bulk of what I'm doing right now. Right. However, there's also uh, personnel management. There's about a dozen other people in the research department. So that comes with uh, a lot of unique uh, duties and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, here and there, I'll try to get out into the field, whether it's joining on Dawn Patrol when we're trying to check out if any crawls, any uh, turtle crawls that we missed the night before, or I'll go out at night and uh, for a few hours join the team as we look for turtles coming out to shore. Oh, that's cool. That's fun. That's fun. Now, you, we, you know, I know we're talking about turtles a little bit, but we really want to focus in on snakes and rattlesnakes or venomous snakes in general. And, you know, is there... I guess just to start off, and and then you did say earlier, you know, they do have a bad reputation, but you know, why should we care about venomous snakes? I guess that's the first question. Like, what's really their importance to ecology? Sure. And when somebody asks me this question, I'll, I'll turn it back on them. I'll say, well, what's your importance? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, that's often kind of a tough, tough question. But I say, you know, what even if you can't really come up with something, I still think you're unique and valuable and worth keeping around for that mm -hmm. alone. Now, that's kind of the innate value that I think that these animals have. However, they do play important ecological roles. They're eating rodents. Uh, they are also serving as prey for um, birds of mm -hmm. prey and, and mammals and other snakes. And then often, uh, we can talk about how their venom can be used in medical research and may actually help produce medicines for us. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, that's true. It's true. It's one of the things, yeah, you, each species we dig into and some of these really obscure ones, it's amazing. Like I, the one that recently we covered was naked mole rats and some of their physiology being able to survive without oxygen for 18 minutes and their anti-aging <laughs> properties. So, you know, each of these species, we look at what nature's designed and finding medical uses, it just, it blows us away. Every week we're like, wow, wow. So do you have any like fun facts about rattlesnakes or venomous snakes in general? Sure. Uh, the fun fact that I like is that you're a lot closer to one right now than you think. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know that anybody, everybody else reacts the same way to that, but you know, they're not that dangerous. Uh, I, I think that when people perceive their risk to a venomous snake, they think that the interaction starts after they've seen the snake and they're both pissed off and scared and then something happens. But I think that the interaction actually starts when you walk by it and it's camouflaged in a bush and you never see it. Right. So I think that causes us to have kind of an elevated sense of risk. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Another cool. Th yeah. And, and another cool thing is that, Rattlesnakes only occur in uh, North and South America. And uh, we've got the world's biggest one right here in the southeastern United States. That's the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. No, it, it's so funny because I was in the military. And so I, 
you know, went through the woods everywhere in Southeast United States or in the Northwest. And I always wondered how many venomous snakes or rattlesnakes or who knows what I've walked by. And I'm sure I would be amazed. <laughs> it just, yeah, they're, they're really cool. They're really cool. Yeah. And we're biased by the TV shows that they cut out the three days of walking in the woods. And all of a sudden you see there's tense face off with a venomous snake that they've already captured. Right. And, um, that, that's really kind of a unique situation. I yeah. Think. Yeah. It, 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 they're everywhere. Um, and you just don't see them. Now, do you have a favorite snake? This, uh, I hope this is the toughest question in the podcast. Yeah. This is <laughs> Probably me on the spot yeah. here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, you know, I already mentioned the Eastern diamondback rattlesnake. It's just this really impressive animal and, and we're, we respect them. They've got the venom, but, um, really if you kind of look at them and see how they carry themselves, Bob Mount, he's a famous Alabama herpetologist. He said they carry themselves with poise and dignity. And that's how I kind of think of that, about that animal. So I, I think I'm going to go with the mm-hmm. Eastern Diamondback. No, uh, I mean, yeah, they're amazing. There's so many amazing snakes and they're just so beautiful. And yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. Now to kind of get in some of the nuts and bolts about your research, you know, what, what are kind of some of your current research goals? Sure. Well, most of my time is dedicated to the loggerhead sea turtles. So if we're going to be thinking big picture, I would like our monitoring and our research to contribute to the recovery of the species and their eventual removal from the Endangered Species Act. That would be the big picture goal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kind of, you know, short term, I'm really interested in how some of these animals uh, sustain injuries from boat propellers, or fish hook ingestion. I've done a bunch of work with how freshwater turtles ingest fish hooks, and I kind of like to carry that mm-hmm. over to sea turtles and, and understand a little bit more about them. Right. And the, I mean, one of the things that we, we keep talking about, especially any species from the ocean, is just the plastics. Now, from your viewpoint as a scientist, do you think – it just seems to me, and maybe I don't know because the last few months I've really been – involved in this, you know, trying to spread the message of conservation and oceans. But to, to you, do you feel like there's kind of this groundswell movement, this anti-plastic cleaning up the oceans? Do you see it from your side? I'm sure hearing a lot more about it lately. Uh, okay. Yeah. Big focus on straws. Uh, people are really mm-hmm. trying to reduce the amount of straws and businesses are trying to cut back as well. I know plastic bags are another big push that people are trying to reduce. So I, I, I do see some encouraging trends. Okay. That's good. It's good to hear. It's, it's hard from, you know, my viewpoint because I'm always looking for this stuff every day in the news. So, you know, from, from a scientist perspective, and is that kind of, you know, I, I guess going back to sea turtles, but, you know, we want to get back to snakes here in a second. Is that one of their, their major threats is pollution? It's one of the threats. You know, if you were to rank them, okay. I don't know that it would be among the top, but certainly individual animals do have a problem with this marine debris. And it's something that, that we do take seriously. Um, you know, if you were to rank yeah. things, I'd probably say habitat loss is one of the big ones, because if there's nowhere for them to nest, then the population is going to crash eventually. Um, interactions with fishing operations is, is a big one, including nets. Uh, but, mm. but yeah, plastics and, and marine debris are up there as well. So when you, as a scientist, right, you sit there and, and it's, I know it's hard cause we, you know, in, in science we have basic research, which is just like basic biology, which doesn't always actually translate into any policy or management. Are the work you're involved with now, is there, are you bridging that science to actual implementation of management policy? Sure. And and it's a mix. And, and I do think there is value in some of that basic information because if you don't know where an animal lives or where it eats or, you know, where, how it mates, then you're really not going to be able to build effective management policies off of that. Uh, So I I do think of the basic research in that context. But then uh, when we're talking about something like fish hooks, if we, better understand what kind of hooks they're swallowing, what kind of baits are on the hook when they go after them, what species are vulnerable. That's stuff that can inform specific management recommendations. And and we can make, we can generate the information and make those recommendations. Uh, but it's the policymakers and the legislators that take it from there and um, 
we, we do have right. a good relationship with state and federal agencies that work on that stuff. Right, right. Yeah. No, no, that's good. That's, yeah, that was, that was a great explanation. Now, can you talk about some of the work that you've done in the diamondback rattlesnake or the eastern indigo snake? Sure. Yeah, the eastern indigo snake is also on the endangered species list. Uh, it is from Georgia down through Florida, uh, uh, Alabama, and Mississippi. They went locally extinct in Mississippi and Alabama and the Florida panhandle. And basically, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is saying that, or they're going to say, if we want to take the species off of the endangered species list, and that's, that happens when we're not as concerned about it going extinct, then we need to reestablish a couple populations where they uh, disappeared. So I've been involved in a couple reintroductions, one in Alabama and one in Florida, and both of those are ongoing, and we've been releasing uh, a few hundred snakes, some with radio telemetry, and we've learned a lot about that. Mm -hmm. Still a little too early to, to know if it's going to be a self-sustained population, but there are encouraging trends. So you, you say radio telemetry. Can you explain for the listeners how you do that? Like, how, how are you tagging them or, you know? Sure. I, I guess setting that experiment up. Yeah. I think when I say radio telemetry, people often imagine a bear or a wolf with a collar around its neck. Right, right, right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And as you can imagine, when you look at a snake, it's basically one big neck, right? So it's just going to slide that collar right off. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so the way that we attach radio transmitters is uh, surgical implantation. And this is done by veterinarians. It's all very serious and sterile. It's a, it's a real surgery. Uh, and then mm -hmm. it's basically a little battery that sends out frequencies. And we have a, a receiver and we can, each animal has a unique frequency. So if we turn into that frequency, we can point the antenna and by the strength of the signal, we can figure out where that animal is. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, it's cool stuff. It's, it, it's really cool stuff. I, I know my wife was working with some of that with bees, like putting little microchips on bees and, and trying to, to work uh, with that. And then actually uh, a Kiwi researcher down here, I just watched the whole thing on, she was actually tracking around uh, using radio telemetry uh, with them. So, you know, pretty powerful stuff. Cool. Uh, that, that's in your toolbox, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so this one I, I really want to get into a little bit. And how it's the the research article that you just published, Interspecific Combat Observed Among Viperid Snakes. Did I say that right? Vip Viperid yeah. Snakes, right? Yeah. Okay. So, I, I get, you know, as a scientist myself, I'm like, how in the heck did you set this experiment up? <laughs> I guess if you could describe that, or I guess I uh, just talk about the article, like okay. what were you doing? What were your research goals? And then how in the heck did you actually observe? Sure. This? Well, it's kind of a unique situation. Uh, it involves a citizen scientist and uh, I'm pretty well known for my science communication and my outreach and people mm -hmm. send me questions mm -hmm. every day. I'll get dozens of questions and you can find me on Twitter at mm -hmm. alongside wild. If you have your own questions. Uh, but I got an email from, this woman, Dawn, in Arkansas, and she said, I videotaped something strange when I was walking my dogs the other day, and it looks mm -hmm. like a cottonmouth and a copperhead fighting. Yeah. Do you mind taking a look and, and seeing what you think? And uh, that, that was pretty unusual, and I was already getting ready to explain that she misidentified the animals, and this is what was really happening. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when I hit play, she she got it exactly right. It was a cottonmouth and a copperhead fighting. And vipers fight for mates. There's a lot of different ways to compete over them. But what they do is kind of this ritualized combat where they have their front, two, front third of their body in the air and they're intertwining each other and throwing themselves down to the ground. Uh, and that's exactly what was in this really cool video. Uh, so I put it on YouTube and I started mm -hmm. generating a, a scientific publication describing it. And that's yeah, awesome. And, and Dawn is an author and it, that's in ecology and um, it's pretty neat. It's okay. a, a scientific journal that publishes kind of big research papers, but they recently started accepting one natural history note, each journal, each issue. And, and they selected okay. this one. Okay. 
Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's so much to be discovered and you know, it's, it, that that's just, I saw that title and I was like, Oh my God, that's awesome. That's really awesome. Yeah. That's so yeah. what are some, yeah. Yeah. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a good reminder that we still have a lot to learn about these animals. It's, it's a uh, kind of a unique behavior. It's rarely seen. And the fact that two different species are doing it raises a whole bunch of questions that just are begging for somebody to do some controlled studies about it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Have fun setting that one up. It would just be amazing to uh, to, to observe and, and understand why they're doing that. So what are some of the, in, as far as snakes, some of the conservation issues that, that you've recently looked at or are focusing on in the future? Sure. As I mentioned, there's the ongoing indigo snake reintroductions, and I'm still peripherally involved mm -hmm. uh, in those. I, I have a student, uh, Sarah Piccolomini. She's radio tracking the animals that are released in Florida. I'm, I'm really interested mm -hmm. in kind of landscape scale habitat use of these animals. And, and the reason why is that we can't figure out how to share landscapes until we know how the animals are using them as well. Uh, so that's been kind of mm -hmm. my focus in the past. And then this year, I've kind of been shifting gears, moving more towards the sea turtles. But um, I still hope to have at least one foot in the snake world moving forward as well. Right. Yeah, kind of juggling uh, a bunch of different issues, which we do as scientists, right? It's not always just one area or, or one specific thing. So yeah, I, I, one of the things you were talking about, the radio telemetry, how far do these – because we haven't – just tell the listeners, I'm, I'm doing this interview before Angie and I have even recorded our – our Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake, which we're going to do, I think in, in, in a week, uh, we'll record it and then publish in a few weeks out. But my question is how far do they range or the Eastern Indigo since you're, that's what you're doing your study on. Yeah. And, and you hit the nail on the head uh, in that the species are different, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got mm -hmm. brown snakes, DK's brown snake, and they can live in your backyard and they'll never leave. You know, they can, they can live in urban areas and woodlots. And then you have uh, animals like the indigo snake, and they could be using, you know, a couple dozen football fields mm -hmm. in uh, an area that size. Uh, and that's because they use different habitats at different times of the year. In the winter, they're going to be in the uplands, living in tortoise burrows. In the summer, they're going to be down in wetlands foraging. And so there's kind of this migration aspect to their natural history that allows them to use a big chunk of land. Right, right. Yeah, no, it's it's cool. It's cool. Now, one of the questions Angie wanted me to ask is, have you ever bitten by a snake, either a constrictor or venomous snake? You mean today? Yeah, did you give it today? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been bitten by many, many snakes, mm -hmm. and they're usually the non-venomous, well, they're always the non-venomous kind. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the venomous snakes, I'm extremely careful, and I think many of our perceptions are biased by some of the nature shows that we'll see. There's often a guy taking what well, I'd say unnecessary risks with these dangerous animals mm -hmm. for the benefit of the viewer. Mm -hmm. When I capture a snake, people might think it's boring. Uh, I use tools. I never touch it with my hands. Uh, I've got a big snake hook. I've got snake tongs. I'll put it in a bucket, very slow, methodical and careful. So I've never been bitten by a venomous snake and I hope that won't change. Yeah. Knock on wood. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So I, you know, I guess that kind of leads into the next question is, you know, the misconceptions about venomous snakes and I guess snake bites in general, because I've, I've been bitten by non venomous snakes too. And you know, it, it, sometimes it might draw a little blood depending on the species you're right. Venomous snakes, just respect them. You know, especially if you see them in the wild, just give them a lot of room. But what are some of the other misconceptions that the public has? Yeah. You know, I actually just finished a draft of a new book called secrets of snakes and the science of their myths, where I tackle a lot of the most common snake questions and misconceptions that I got. And, you know, probably at the top of the list is that they're aggressive, that they're going to be coming after you, that they're going to be chasing at you. Uh, they're going to be falling after trees. They're going to be, you know, <laughs> just waiting for you to stumble into them so they can kill you. And if snakes were half as dangerous as people perceive them to be, we'd all 
have died off a long time ago. Yeah, no, I don't know. I guess it just goes back to the the, the Bible. I don't know. It's just poor snakes. They just have such a bad rap. It's 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 a, it's unfortunate. So if you know someone's out you know, on a nature hike, you know, I when I was doing some some field work, you know, I've ran across rattlesnakes in the field. You know, what's your advice to people when they see them? How should they react? Uh, get excited. You know, they're hard to find. How lucky is it to see a rattlesnake out in the open? Do you, if you have a camera, take a few pictures, not with your macro lens, preferably with a zoom lens. Um, back off, give them their space. We're often learning new and surprising things. And if the snake isn't startled, doesn't know you're there, maybe you can observe something new, just like Dawn did in Arkansas and see them fighting different species. Mm -hmm. But the critical thing is, you know, leave them to themselves and, and it's unlikely that you're going to have any problem. Right. Right. Forget yeah. bird watching. Yeah. Forget bird watching. There should be snake watching. That's what <laughs> I want. You heard it here first. Yeah. Uh, let's I, see this take off. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. And it's funny. It's, it's, uh, Angie's like really big into birding, but you're, you're right. Snakes, it's, they're so hard to find. And then when you do see them, you know, it's, you know, you're, you're amazed. And, and I'll be honest, like I, this was in my, my college years. I was, I was following a, a wild horse herd and I saw this rattlesnake and I, I was freaking out, but I'm in my truck. I'm like, it can't touch me. It's just that, that, <laughs> you know, and I was, yeah, I think 20. So, you know, later in life, you realize how awesome these creatures really are and they just do have a bad rap and, you know, we need to bust some of these myths with them. Yeah. And, and you know what they are? potentially dangerous. So I like to be real about it. I mean, mm -hmm. every once in a while we call it a legitimate bite. It's like you accidentally stepped on one or you were reaching for something and you, and you pick one up. So I, I think a little common sense goes a long way. Watch where you put your hands, watch where you put your feet. But the number one way to avoid a snake bite is to just leave them alone. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Now I, you know, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, I guess your opinion and I could probably wonder what you would say, but the, these rattlesnake roundups they have, like how is that impacting their population, the snake population? Like in Texas, I know this is a big thing. And the environment, like how does that, you know, influence the environment? Well, it's certainly not good for the individual snakes, is it? No, no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just, uh, you know, it's horrible. It, it's really. Uh, yeah. And, and just from an animal welfare or an animal rights perspective, it's pretty horrific mm -hmm. uh, to be rounding up all of these animals and, and killing, killing them in, in really uh, a way that I think is, you know, if, if you'll, if you'll humor me, I, I'd say it's disrespectful to, yeah. to the animals and, and the natural world. Uh, out West, most of those roundups involve Western diamondback rattlesnakes mm -hmm. And there is some question as to how the collection techniques might influence the environment because sometimes they're putting gasoline and gas fumes in some of these nooks and crannies out hmm. there in the landscapes. Uh, and so obviously that's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously when you're taking snakes out, that's less individuals and we don't have a very good understanding as to what population level uh, issues are going on there. Uh, on, on one hand, they say those rodeos are necessary to reduce the snake population so that people don't get bitten. Uh, but when environmental advocates say concern, say their concerns, they say there's no population level impact. So um, there's no real concern there. So it, it's kind of mixed messages. Right. Uh, right. I, I'm not a big fan. In the yeah. southeastern United States, it's a little different. There are only a handful of roundups left one in, in Alabama and one in Georgia. And there's been a lot of work by folks down here, like John Jensen of the Georgia department of natural resources, working with some of these communities to transform their roundups into wildlife appreciation festivals. Yeah. I went to one in Claxton, Georgia mm -hmm. used mm -hmm. to be a roundup. Now they have live snakes and it's educational. That's awesome. That is what we need to be doing. That is amazing. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And in the Southeast, the roundups typically involve Eastern diamondback rattlesnakes and closely related to the Westerns, but enough differences to make us a little bit more concerned about the effects of, of roundups. Mm -hmm. Certainly intensive collection 
in one area over a few years is probably going to have a population level impact on that species. No, and you know, and I've lived all over the United States. It it, it just seems I don't know, maybe it's just because I grew up in California and lived in Washington State for a while in Texas. It just seems like there's more open areas there, I guess. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. You know, if you look at square acreage or whatever in the southeast, it just seemed like I know Florida is becoming like one big city. It's just eventually there's not going to be any wild left in Florida, you know, um, in Georgia. Well, come I mean, on, let's like, not let's not throw in the towel here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of pretty amazing uh, spaces, even in the peninsula. But I'm thinking in, in the panhandle. It's right. pretty wild. And hey, we've got panthers. Not many pe- places in the eastern United States no. can, can boast. No, it's just, oh, it's just growing. Like, I guess Orlando out is the area. I'm like, it's just, there is no wild yeah. in there except people in Disney World, you know. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a different topic. And I, it, and again, I can edit this out if, if you don't want to talk about it. But, you know, your opinion about people having snakes as pets. Sure. Uh, well, I don't own any pets myself. <laughs> and uh, that includes snakes and Dogs, cats, anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I, yeah, I have kind of mixed feelings about this because I know that there are individual people out there that provide excellent lives for these animals. Mm-hmm. Whether we're talking about enrichment and health, they're members of the family. They care about them. They really take good care of these animals. Uh, but on an industry scale, I I do have concerns about the pet industry and their collective effects on the welfare of individual animals, Mm -hmm. but also uh, pressure from collection on, on wild populations. Right. No, I know one of the the pressures with snapping turtles is they're just getting taken for the pet trade. And you're like, come on, you know, taken out of their environment, you know, not bred in captivity or anything like that. So, yeah, it, it, we go back and forth. Angie, you know, she's not a huge fan of reptiles as pets, um, but I know there there are people out there that that do do a lot of good work with them and good education. You know, we have a couple friends that that do work with them. I guess my next question would be, you know, to our listeners or just the average person, what could they do to help snake conservation, and then what could they do to help turtle conservation? Sure. Well, there's a lot of organizations out there, a lot of individuals out there working for these animals, everything from the Wildlife Conservation Society to the Turtle Survival Alliance. Uh, These are people working hard to protect these species. Uh, But on a local level, sometimes it's just about expressing your enthusiasm and saying that you value these animals, providing an example to your friends and family and neighbors that these are animals that, that are worth having around. And I think that can be a really productive way to make a difference in how we perceive these scaly, smelly creatures (laughs) that uh, we share our landscapes with. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes it comes down to voting. Uh, It's not an answer that I think people often give, but, you know, when, when the rubber hits the road, it's often government policies and legislation that protect the animals and the habitats that we care about. So consider it supporting the politicians and the policies that are consistent with how you want them to be treated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I know. And it's, it's like, we try not to get too political on this podcast, but it's kind of hard not to sometimes. And I, well, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know. I didn't say anything specifically, but <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I, I urge people to vote according to their conscience. Yes. And often, often there is a difference in, in how yeah. the different candidates perceive the natural world. Yeah. So I don't know. And I know you're not a climate scientist, but you know, it's hard, especially, you know, I was looking at stress effects on, on mammal reproduction and with heat stress and with climate change from a perspective on the turtles, also the snakes, is that going to be, or is that a major concern, I guess, for the, for their ecology and conservation? Yeah, it's kind of a big question mark, but there are a number of reasons for us to be concerned. For one, these animals are ectothermic, right? These mm-hmm. That's what we used to call cold-blooded. Uh, but then we realized that these animals, through their behavior and where they position their body, they can maintain really warm temperatures 
with great precision. So we don't really say they're cold blooded. We say they're ectothermic, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but that means that they're really sensitive to the temperature and the external environment. They can't maintain the same body temperature that we can through, through our metabolism. Um, but they're adaptable too. And so they can shift with, with their habitat. Maybe they'll have to bask less if mm-hmm. it warms up. Um, but turtles in general have temperature dependent sex determination. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the temperature of the developing eggs will determine what sex the babies are. Uh, the general trend is that as it gets warmer, there's going to be more females. So depending on how drastic your climate models are, we might predict the population of all females, which presents unique problems that you can probably imagine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, yeah, that was one of the things we covered in, in the snapping turtle. And it's just trying to imagine, you know, how a, a warmer climate is going to affect their, them. You know, obviously it's affecting plant life and insects and all this stuff. So it's just, it's just, it's a theme that, that we cover, even though, you know, we're not climate scientists, but from animal science perspective, it is going to be a major, major issue. Yeah. You know, to quote, Malcolm and Jurassic Park, life finds a way, right? Yeah, there's, true. There's, we can talk about the impacts and the likely impacts, but we're probably going to be surprised, which is scary and also reassuring. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems when it comes to sea turtles is going to be the rising sea levels and how it, what, how, what effect it's going to have on their nesting beaches. And so that's one of the things that I, I'm particularly concerned about. I'm not sure how, how we adapt to that. No, that's a great, that's a great, great point. You're right. You're right. It's, you know, when those beaches disappear, where are they going to go? You know, it's, you know, I even seen some climate predictions that, you know, half of Florida is going to be underwater or Miami. I think yeah. it was Miami's going to be gone, you know, with, with rising sea levels. So <laughs> another topic for another day. So, you know, we've got a few more minutes. I don't want to, you know, keep you tied up too long. What's some of the best advice if you, if we have a young listener right now, and they want to get in the field of animal conservation. I know we touched a little bit upon this in the beginning, but what are some of the things you would tell them, you know, to get involved or how to, how to start getting involved? Yeah, I'd start getting involved by spending time outside, maybe get a field guide from a bookstore or take one from the library or a friend, start familiarizing yourself with the creatures and the systems and the, uh, you know, the biology of the systems around you. And that's going to give you a jump. It's going to give you an increased appreciation, understanding. Uh, I recommend if people are interested in becoming conservation biologists that they attend college and graduate school. So that should be something that people are thinking about. Uh, Take advantage of opportunities as they come. Internships, uh, volunteers, if, if you're comfortable doing so, uh, try, try to take advantage of those opportunities and, and, paying positions as well. They're, they're out there. Right. No, no, that's great. That's great. Do you have any, uh, I forgot to ask this earlier. Do you have any citizen science projects going on right now or the, uh, your, where you're working at, at the sea, Tur- sea turtle center? Yeah. Everything that we do, uh, in- involves visitors to, to such a great extent. We have a lot of educational programs. <laughs> um, we've got people out there, there are eyes and ears in some case. So that's kind of an unofficial a citizen science program and, and I'm interacting with citizen scientists every day on Twitter and mm-hmm. on my blog when they send me questions. I know there's, there's uh, one individual in Florida that's become really interested in Cuban tree frogs, uh, which mm-hmm. is an invasive species mm-hmm. eating the natives. So he's been keeping track of all the ones that he's been finding in his yard and tracking to see if, if native species uh, uh, rebound and, 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 you know, we've got people like Don in Arkansas who's, who's sending me videos saying, I think I saw something new and, and ended up being something really exciting that we yeah, amazing. got to publish yeah. a paper on. Yeah, no, no. And and for the listeners, I, I know Angie and I talk about this a lot. Citizen science is where you can get involved with research projects and there are, you know, in all, a bunch of different species. And so I will definitely put all these links in the show notes with David's work. So if you're interested, you, you can participate. Yeah. One way that, uh, 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 one citizen recently got involved was that he was fishing and he caught a bullhead 
And when he was removing the hook, he found a, a baby rattlesnake inside. And so he was posting that about that on Twitter. He registered the observation an eye naturalist. And it was actually the first time that uh, really any fish had been seen eating this kind of rattlesnake before. So I helped him write that up as a, as a note in Herpetological Review. It's a scientific journal. It was the eye naturalist observation of the week last week, oh, early awesome. June. So <clears throat> maybe you can check that out too. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I got I to find all these links. That's really cool. That's really cool. So where, I guess if, if people wanted to find more accurate information on snakes, where could they go? Your, your website, your blog, or is there other places they could go? Sure. Well, you know, it, there's a lot of information out there, and depending on what they're interested in, uh, they can check. Often each state has its own uh, site about the mm -hmm. snakes that are in their uh, borders, and that's going to be a state agency. You know, find me, and, and I can help you uh, find the information that you're looking for. Uh, that could be a good start. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Now, before I get to my last question, you know, about some of your contact info, I always like to ask this in my interviews, and it's kind of a deep one, but, you know, I, I always like to uh -oh. ask... Yeah, no, no. It's just, you know, it, it, we've touched upon it in this interview, but, you know, how do we convince people to save these animals that it's worth spending millions of dollars? It's worth thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of work that not only, you know, do you and, and your staff put in, but people from around the world. How do we convince the public that this is worthwhile and worth our attention? Yeah, you know, if it was an easy answer, then we wouldn't even be stressing <laughs> about it, right? So, I know, I know. Yeah, so I, I like to communicate my enthusiasm and my appreciation for these animals. And, and hopefully uh, some of that comes across, and, and it does. I, I know I've changed people's views on, on some of these reptiles, and so that's what I talk about. Uh, however... You know, we can talk a lot about maybe there's going to be a medicine. Maybe they play an important ecological role. But I just think they're valuable because they are unique. Millions of years of evolution have led to this other creature that we are lucky enough to be sharing this brief glimpse of time with. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's amazing. And there's so many secrets. They've got their own lives. Uh, it, it's a lot to learn. So that's what I go for. I, that, this is why I asked that question. That's, that's amazing insight. You're so right. I mean, one of the things I always cover is evolution and it's, the point is it's taken millions of years to get to this point and we're still evolving. You know, these animals are still changing in another million years. They'll look different. So, uh, that's great. That's great. Uh, yeah, I guess the final question is, you know, how can we support your work? And I, I already gave the website. It was www.davidasteen.com. Uh, you have a Facebook group, right? Yep. And I, blog, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the science communication and outreach that I do is kind of under the umbrella of the Alongside Wildlife Foundation. And you can mm -hmm. find that website at alongsidewildlifefoundation.org. And um, I've got a blog, Living Alongside Wildlife. Facebook, it's backslash, backslash living alongside wildlife. I'm mm -hmm. on Twitter and Instagram at alongside wild, and I'm answering people's questions there. Uh, now, at the Georgia Sea Turtle Center, you can check us out at georgiaseaturtlecenter.org. I hope you'll come and visit. We've got a lot of programs. You can even get on the beach with us as we look for mm -hmm. loggerhead sea turtles. So there's a lot of options there. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I'll, again, I'm going to put all this on our website. It's, you know, especially if you go to Jekyll Island, it's a beautiful part of the state of Georgia. I've been there. It, next time I, you know, go to Atlanta and see my little sister, I will try to get down there and see your place because that's, it's a beautiful part of the country. Great. Um, we can do an in person interview and video. Yeah. 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 And Angie's only a few hours south of you. So, you know, okay. living there in Gainesville in, in Florida. But David, thank you so much. I know you, you're busy. You're doing a lot of this outreach. We're very fortunate to have you. This was an interview that, that Angie was just super, super excited about. And we appreciate it, you know, sharing your time with our listeners and your insight. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I've been looking forward to it as well. Uh, I was excited at the opportunity. Great. 
Take care.